Hello, welcome to Car Church again tonight. Good to be with you. Welcome all of our friends and family. I know there are many people in different uh, positions to, tonight in this uh, week of interesting weather. Whenever you're watching this, you may be having wonderful weather, but I know there are many that have had snow and storms and different things going on. So if you are uh, uh, have electricity and able to join with us, great. And if you're watching this at another time, uh, we just welcome you to Car Church. It's always a wonderful, wonderful blessing to be with you. And uh, so we welcome you tonight. Tonight's message, we're calling it Armed with Strength. Rebecca has already posted the scriptures. And um, if you want to turn in your Bible, we're going to begin tonight in Psalm chapter 18. So if you want to turn to Psalm chapter 18 around verse 28, and I'm going to let Patty greet you and let's pray together. Hi. First, I want to thank those of you who have been praying for me this week and tell you that I'm happy and healthy and blessed and anointed. I'm getting there. And how important the prayers are. I think if we really understood how important prayers are, we would all be praying a lot. There's so much going on, and we need to be praying. So thank you for those who are praying. I'm doing much better. So let's pray for tonight. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you care so much for us. You care about the word that we're receiving. And there are things in this word tonight that are especially for people. And you know who's out there, and you know who needs it. And Lord, I thank you for the anointing that you have on Mike, for the words that you give him. And we want to give you praise for all that he says tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you have your Bible again, we're in Psalm chapter 18. We're going to be looking around verse 28. And the message we're calling it tonight, Armed with Strength. To begin with, I want to just give you a little brief history of Psalm chapter 18. If you were to look at the very first part of Psalm 18, you'd notice that this psalm was written by David. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord, the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So the context for this passage is that David had just passed through a tremendous period of pressure, a tremendous period of stress and false accusation and uh, being chased by the king of Israel and, uh, you know, just all sorts of problems and pain and difficulty. <clears throat> he had been through a lot in a relatively short period of time, and in, at times very overwhelming. He had to hide in caves. Uh, again, he was being falsely accused by a man to whom he had been perfectly and completely loyal. And so the context for this is that David was rejoicing. He was praising God uh, on the day that he finally achieved and arrived at a point of deliverance. So to begin with, this is important to me because this is not written as a theoretical, philosophical idea. This is written out of the, the cauldron of true human experience. So when he speaks about, or when we speak tonight about being armed with strength, this is something that comes out of David's own experience throughout his life, but particularly in this big battle that he had just passed through. And I want you to look at what it says in verse 28. By the way, I should mention that there's an exact parallel passage of Scripture, 2 Samuel 22, 26, uh, and following. The exact same verses we're about to read are quoted there because that's the, the recording of when David was delivered from the hand of Jonathan and from all of his enemies. Here we see it now in the Psalms, which is the psalm book or the song book, of Israel, where David had written a song of praise about this. And look at verse 28. There's so much rich information here. He says, For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten the darkness. This is verse 28. For by you I can run against a troop. By you I can leap over a wall. 
As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength. What's our title tonight? Armed with strength. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You also have given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. Wow, there's so much here. <clears throat> but I want us to begin in this first verse because there's a key here that unlocks so much in verse 28. It says, For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. This verse, when I was reading it in prepare, preparation this week for, for our time together tonight, the Lord just exploded some revelation in my heart about it. And it comes back again to the power of this concept of Christ's life in us. Notice what he says. He says, you will light my lamp. It's David speaking to God. You will light my lamp. Well, what is the lamp of man? If God's going to light our lamp, what is the lamp of man? Well, the Bible makes it clear to us. And I want us to look over at the passage of Scripture in the book of Proverbs. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 20, Proverbs chapter 20, and verse 27. Proverbs 20, verse 27, tells us what the lamp of man is. The Bible says in verse 27, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. So to begin with, David, in talking about being armed with strength, David starts by saying, for you will light my lamp. So what is the lamp of man? Well, the Bible says that the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. A lamp is where you put a light. So if I'm going to light a lamp, I put the light in the lamp. Well, what's the lamp? The lamp is the spirit of man. But here was a problem. Man's spirit was spiritually dead and incapable of receiving the light of God's spirit in God's life until Jesus had accomplished his work. But now that Jesus has accomplished his work, he can put his light in the spirit of man. And by putting his light in the spirit of man, something else happens. And let's look real quickly at what it says in John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 12. <clears throat> Remember, David is saying, you will light my lamp. What is the lamp? The lamp is the spirit of man. Well, what is this light that is going to be placed in our lamp? Well, he tells us in John chapter 8 verse 12, Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Bible tells it this way in John, first in John chapter 1 and verse 4, in him was life and that life was the light of men. So you put all this together in the very first verse there's this burst of revelation. If I want to be armed with strength, to be armed with strength, it starts with this idea that God has to light my lamp. And how he lights my lamp is my lamp is my human spirit, and he has to light it. Well, how does he light it? He lights it by putting his life inside of it. He says when his light comes inside, then we no longer walk in darkness, but we have the light of life. So this is, this is so important to understand. I, I keep coming back to this again and again because so much of Christianity has been built upon knowledge and information, as though just knowing and having information 
is enough to bring transformation. But you see, we need more than revelation. We need resurrection. We need more than information. We need the transforming power of the dynamic of life. And when the Bible says that God is going to light my lamp and the Lord will enlighten my darkness, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, an Old Testament concealed revelation, which in the New Testament is revealed revelation, we get a full picture. The picture is that man is in darkness spiritually because he is spiritually cut off from the life of God. But when he is born again, his spirit is made alive. And then God can put his light, which in him was light, and that light was the life of men. His life becomes the light of men. His life comes inside of us. And when he does, our spirit is lit. And now it's lit, not just with information and revelation, but with resurrection power and transformational dynamic. And so his life now is inside of us and our lamp is lit. <laughs> and when our lamp is lit, it's lit with his life, not just our head or our brain enlightened by his information, but our very spirit made alive by the power of his life. This is so critical because we can know the Word of God. Paul the Apostle knew the Word of God, but he found he could not perform it. And remember, our goal is to be armed with strength, not just to be armed with information, but to be armed with strength in order to implement, in order to see that revelation actually manifested and revealed through our lives. How does that happen? Well, it starts with God lighting our lamp by placing his light in our spirit, and his light is his life. And when we walk in uh, his light, we have the light of life, John eight twelve says. And then we're not walking in darkness anymore. Now then, we come into verse 29, we begin to see the manifestation of this, when he says, for by you, I can run against a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. You know, the first phrase there is a picture of fearlessness. For by you, I can run against a troop. The word here literally means to rush against in a hostile manner. You know, this is not timidity. This is fearlessness. It's a picture of somebody being able to go against the adversary, go against the enemy, go against the circumstances, go against the situations that are coming against them, and to go uh, rushing against them with hostility without being intimidated by them. There's a fearlessness here. Well, how does that come? He tells us, by you, not from me. This is not something I muster up out of my ability. This is something that happens as a result of my lamp being lit by the light of your life. And as a result of this, by you, I can run against a troop. There's a fearlessness. But then he says, second of all, by my God, I can leap over a wall. The word here literally means to spring over like a stag. It's literally a picture of somebody of an of a, of a animal that just leaps over. You know, when I was living out in Wyoming, many times we would see an elk that would come up to a fence that was twice as tall as it was, and this, it would just rear up on its hind legs and just go right over the top of it. This is a picture of a limitlessness because it's something that normally could not be done by man, but gives the ability to leap over a wall. So here is a picture of fearlessness and limitlessness that comes as the result of our light, our lamp being lit by the light of his life on the inside of us. So we're no longer walking in darkness, but we're walking in the light of his life. By him, we can do these things. By him, we can leap over a wall. 
In verse 30, he says, as for God, his way is perfect. This word here for perfect, it means to be without blemish. It means to be undefiled or whole or complete with integrity, to be wholesome or innocent. And the word for way, his way is perfect, means his manner, his course of life, the path of God. So God's path, God's course of life, God's manner of operational is undefiled. There's a perfection about it. It has integrity. It's whole. It's complete. Well, here's the good news. His way is perfect. We're going to see this in just a minute. His way is whole, complete, perfect, with integrity. And his life is in us. And when his life is in us and being given opportunity to be expressed through us, then what we can't do, he can do. What we would fear, we can approach fearlessly because he is without fear. What we would not be able to do, leap over a wall, he can do through us if it's something he's calling us to be able to do. So it's by the power of his life, by you, by you, by you. He goes on to say the word of the Lord is proven and is a shield to all who trust in him. The word here, proven, is a really interesting word because it's a word that means refined in a fire. It means to be tested, to be without alloy, to have no, uh, no dross. And so he's saying the word of God is tested, it's proven, it's pure. There's no admixture in it. It can be trusted. And he's a shield to those who trust in him. To trust in him means to take refuge in him. It means uh, to be under his shadow. In essence, it means that this is no longer about just mental assent. Oh, I trust the Lord. Do we? You see, so many times I think we, we think we trust the Lord. We think his word is proven. But when we come up against situations, we think it's up to us to be able to handle them. It's up to us to face them that we have to be able to leap over this wall. We have to be able to face this foe fearlessly. And so we try and muster these things up in us, and we don't have the capacity, and inherently we know we don't have the ability. And because we don't know that we don't have the ability, we shrink back. Rather than trusting God's word and what God can do, we shrink back and, and we limit and we walk in fear as to what we can do and what we can achieve and what we can, what we can come up against because we still think it's about us. We still think it's about us living our life for the Lord. We look in ourselves, we see limitation, we see fear. We look at the circumstances, they seem greater than we are, and we shrink back. But you see, the Lord says his word is proven. And he's a shield to those who take refuge in him. They go beyond this idea of mental assent to trust mm -hmm. to where they actually entrust themselves to him. Lord, here's a situation. I can't do this. I don't know how to face this situation. I don't know how to, how to take this on. But Lord, you're calling me to it. And if you're calling me to it, your word is tested and proven and what I can't do, you can do. By you, by you, I can run through a troop. By you, I can leap over a wall. You know, I can remember when I was a young guy, uh, there's a number of people from my old Thursday night group, college Bible study that might be listening tonight or will this week. And maybe this is a story you don't know, but when I was a young guy, I was working in the youth ministry at the church where I was pastoring and, uh, or where I was on staff. And one day we had a, a youth ministry, ministry expert, a, a nationally known youth ministry expert who came and was making a presentation uh, to the leaders, the youth leaders from several different churches and from around our region, but we were hosting it. And I was listening this whole time to this very gifted and very insightful leader but in my heart, there was a growing burden that had been growing for a number of months. And my burden had begun to grow for college students. 
we were working with youth and high school students, but I noticed in our congregation that once it, we had great youth ministries, junior high, children's ministries, youth ministries, high school ministries, but I noticed when, it, when a kid got out of high school, he kind of fell off the radar. There wasn't really anything much for him until we got into an older singles ministry, uh, you know, in the, in the 30s and 40s. And I got concerned about this group from 18 to around 30 years of age. What, what are we doing for them? And I began to feel a calling on my spirit to do something for college students. And so at one point they were doing a Q&A and I raised my hand and uh, I said, uh, can I ask you a question? And he said, certainly. I said, what do you think about college ministry? Well, without hesitation, I'll just tell you, without hesitation, now, this is a youth minister, a very well-known youth ministry expert. He said to me, don't waste your time. They're too busy. They're in school. Uh, they're, they don't have the time to give to youth ministry. It's a lot of energy, a lot of effort. You won't get much return on your investment. And I'd really, you know, I wouldn't worry, but I wouldn't get involved with it. Well, you know, honestly, my, my, my heart kind of sank because my spirit, my spirit was saying, I don't know, I feel like the Lord's calling me to do this. And yet, here's somebody who knows a whole lot more than I do telling me that this is not something that's really going to be successful. But you know, the more I prayed about it and the more I considered it, and we were working with some people, we had a small group at the time of about six or seven, 12, 15 people. Um, and, and I just felt like this is something God's involved in. And so, you know, I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to make this work. I don't know how this can be successful. I certainly don't have any experience or background, and I don't know even who to turn to to get help. But, Lord, I feel like this is something you want me to invest myself in, and I'm going to do it. Well, the long story short is by the power of the Lord, some amazing things eventually happened. Over 10 years of of that uh, group of ministry and, and hundreds of people that got touched and ministered to through that. But here's the point. It wasn't something that I came up with a great plan or an idea of how to do this. As a matter of fact, it was something I didn't think I could do and I didn't know how to do it. All I knew is that God was calling me to it. And the thing is, what I was beginning to learn as I've been learning my whole life is that if God calls me to something, it's because he plans to do it through me if I'll, if I'll let him. Well, this is the picture here. As for God, his way is perfect. His word is proven. He is a shield to those who will put their refuge in him. If it's up to me to do it, it's going to fail. But if he's going to do it through me, then I can run through a troop I can leap over a wall by the power of his spirit. Now he goes on to say in verse 31, for who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? He poses a rhetorical question. Well, let me give you the answer to it. No one. Who's a God except the Lord? No one. Who's a rock except our God? No one. Praise God. He's the rock. He's God. Who's, who is going to defeat something God is calling us to do if he's going to do it through us? Who could possibly keep it from succeeding? If we are, if it's up to us to do it, very little chance of success. If he's going to do it through us, incredible opportunities. By the way, that's also true of every area of our life. It's true of our of our marriages. It's true of our parenting. It's true of our work. It doesn't matter what, what vocation we're in. Whatever it is that we are called to, we have to put our refuge and our trust in him. You know, it says, uh, who is a rock except our God? Well, if you remember, Jesus told a parable of a man who heard the word of God, but he didn't put it into practice. And he built his house on a sand, and the winds and the storms and the rains came, and his house fell. But another man heard the word of God and entrusted himself to it. He actually said, I don't know how this is going to happen, but I'm going to trust myself to what you said. And he built his house on a rock. Same wind, same rain, same storm, but his house stood. Why? Because it was founded on a rock. What was the difference? The difference was not one man heard and one man didn't hear. Both men heard the word, but one man entrusted himself to it. 
He said, God, if you say this is the way it's supposed to be, I don't know what I'm going to do, how I'm going to sort this out, how these issues are going to get resolved. But if your word tells me something, I'm going to say, by my God, I can run through a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. I can handle this situation. Whatever the results are, if you're doing it through me, Saints, I'm telling you, there's nothing more important in this life than learning how to hear from the Lord and then to trust that what you hear from him, he will do through you. That you let go of taking care of yourself. You let go of trying to do it yourself. You let go of managing, strategizing, coming up with clever ideas of how you're going to help God keep his promise. Instead, you entrust yourself to him, relinquish control, and yield yourself to his life. You do it his way. You do it his way. You do it his way. You have the guarantee of his life power and dynamic to do it through you. Let's look at just a little further on. He says now in verse 32, it is God who arms me with strength. Listen, God's not asking us to muster up strength for him. He says, I want to arm you with strength by the power of my life. I can do, Paul, Paul said, all things through Christ who gives me strength. The strength is not from me, it's through me. Not from me, through me. And when it comes through his power, I find he can do things I can't do. He can be patient when I can't be patient. He can love when I can't love. He, he has wisdom that I don't have. He has stamina and strength and capacity that I don't possess. It is God who arms me with strength. And he makes my way perfect. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember this? Verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. Again, what are the, what's the word? His way means his path, his manner. And what is perfect, it means to be without alloy. It means to be completely uh, completely trustworthy. It means to have integrity, to be undefiled and without blemish. Well, guess what? He says to us here, he makes my way perfect. How does he do that? Because he comes on the inside of me. And by the power of his life in me, his way is perfect. He can make my way perfect. In other words, he can bring integrity and wholeness and completeness to my life by the power of his life. This doesn't come by him giving me information as to how to do it. This comes by him coming inside of me to do it through me as I cooperate with his spirit and relinquish control. You know, i got to tell you one quick story about this. Just uh, this week, uh, my daughter uh, was, she had a, a whole lot going on. She, she had a, a, a one of her, her, her son was not feeling well. She had a ton of work she had to do, end of the year kind of stuff. She had all these th things going on, a lot of challenges, things coming at her because her, her child was uh, not feeling well, couldn't be in school. And so all of this was kind of around her and she was looking, here I am, here's what I got to get done. I don't know how in the world with all those responsibilities and with taking care, I'm going to pull all this off. And we were talking about it and I reminded her that, you know, there was a time when I was in school and I had to finish a paper on, on a day where I had so much going on and I can't even tell you what all was going on, but I went and got before Lord said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I can't do it, but you called me to go to school. You called me to take this, this uh, course of study. And so here I am. I'm offering myself up to you. By you, <laughs> I can run through a troop. By you, I can leap over a wall. So I'm going to just start writing and trust you. And I just went to work. And when it was over, I ended up getting an A plus on that paper. I mean, I don't know. I can't even tell you how I finished the paper. It was a miracle. Well, she told me, you know what, dad, I got to tell you, same thing happened to me. I kind of took your advice and said, Lord, I got to get this done. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And she said, I honestly don't know how I got it finished. I got it finished a day before I needed to. And it's complete and done and finished. And I, it's a miracle. I don't have no idea how I did it. 
can I tell you, there's so much in my life throughout the course of my life, so many times I've come to the end of myself. You know, in the early days, I used to think, oh, God's disappointed. I got to muster up some more strength. I got to try harder. Now I get to the end of myself quick. I mean, even if I think I can do it, I say, Lord, it doesn't matter if I think I can do it. I don't want to do it. I want you to do it through me and quickly agree with the Lord about my inability because when I'm weak, that's when he's strong. So what does it say here? He makes my way perfect. How does he do that? By coming inside of me. His way is perfect. Now he makes my way perfect by the power of his life. I'm telling you, if you ever get a hold of some of this, it can be so revolutionary and release you from so much striving and so much human effort trying to produce and replicate the life of Christ rather than learning how to cooperate with letting Christ live through us. He says in verse 33, He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he sets me on my high places. I love that picture because to be set on a high place means I didn't climb up there. I didn't get there by my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me on my high places. When I relinquish control, put my trust in his word, put my refuge in him and let him be my shield, let him light my lamp with the life of his spirit, and then by him, I allow him to arm me with strength. I allow him to do the work. By him, I run through a troop. By him, I leap over a wall. By him, my way is made perfect. By him, I have the feet of a deer. By him, I'm set on the high place. Then verse 34, he teaches my hands to make war so my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Even when I don't know what to do, he'll teach me what to do. He'll show me what to do. Look at verse 35. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. You know, I'm almost at the end here. Let me just take one moment and look at this. Your right hand has held me up. What is the right hand? What is the right hand? And what does it mean to be held up? Right here, this word held me up, it means to prop, to uphold, to sustain, to support. And the picture here is of something that is strengthening, empowering, and producing the capacity in us that we cannot do in ourselves. Notice what he says, your right hand, your right hand has held me up, has produced in me the strength, has sustained me, has upheld me, has, up, has propped me up. What is the right hand? Let's look just real quickly at this. Because when you see this in its fullness, it is so powerful. Look what it says here in Psalm 98. Psalm 98 and verse 1. It says, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. He, his right hand is a picture of the, his power, his strength. Look what it says over, for example, in the book of Psalms and verse 44. Psalm verse 44 and verse 3, speaking about Israel, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them, but it was your right hand and your arm and the light of your countenance because you favored them. Israel never won their victories by the power of their sword or the power of their right arm. They won by the power of his own arm, his right arm, his right hand. Well, what is this? Well, look what it says here in Mark. Mark chapter 16 and verse 19. Mark 16 and verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Who's it talking about? Jesus. 
Who is the right hand of God? Jesus. Look what it says in Romans. Look at what it says in Romans in chapter 8 and verse 34. Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of God. What is the right hand of God? It's Christ himself. One last verse of scripture. Look what it says in the book of Acts. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 33. Acts 2 verse 33. Peter's preaching. He's preaching about Jesus' resurrection. Notice what he says. Verse 33. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. I don't have time to get into all of this, but when he says, your right hand has held me up, we see the concealed revelation and mystery in the Old Testament that becomes a revealed revelation to us in the New Testament. What does it mean to be upheld by the right hand of God? It means that we are supported, propped up, that the very dynamic and sustaining power of God is in Christ, and in Christ is life, and his life is the light that is put into the lamp of our spirit, and that brings that light and power and strength of his life through us so that we can run through a troop, we can leap over a wall. He arms us with strength. He is the God that there is none beside. He's the rock that there is no other that we can build our life upon. We've got to learn to build the entirety, not just when we're in emergency, not just when we're under circumstances we can't control. The entirety of our life has got to be built upon the rock of the power of his life in us so that everything that we do, every day, every circumstance, every situation, we say, Lord, I thank you that you are the light of my lamp. I don't walk in darkness anymore. By you, I can run through truth. By you, I can leap over a wall. By your power, by your strength, Lord, you arm me. You arm me with strength. You make my way perfect. You make my feet like a deer. You set me on my high places. You teach my hands to fight whatever battles are necessary. You've given me the shield of your salvation. And Jesus, you are upholding me. Last verse, look what he says. Your gentleness has made me great. What a powerful verse of scripture. Can I tell you what it means in closing? The word for gentleness here, it means humility, meekness, condescension. Condescension is what happens when somebody of a high position voluntarily places them in a low position. Can I tell you who has done that? Jesus. He has voluntarily condescended in humility and meekness to indwell and make us his temple and dwell and live in us so that his gentleness, his meekness, his humility, his condescension has made us great. And the word there for great means to multiply, to increase he became sin for us, humility, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He became poor for us that we might become rich in the Spirit. Everything he did in his humility was in order to release within our lives the greatness of his Spirit and power. So saints, what does it mean to be armed with strength? To be armed with strength means that we're not leaning on our own arms. <laughs> Remember what the psalmist said. It was not by their arm that they were delivered, but by the right hand and the arm of the Lord. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're facing, 
circumstances, situations, relationships, physical issues, whatever you're facing in this world, you can be armed with strength. It's not you mustering up strength to try and be a better Christian for God. No. It's saying, Lord, light the lamp. Release your power. By you, I can be fearless. By you, I can be led to anything that you're calling me to. So, saints, let's pray tonight. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful tonight that we can be armed with strength. We're so thankful tonight to know that it's not by might nor by power, not our might, not our power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. It's never been about our might, never been about our power. It's always been about the might and the power, the strength and the dynamic of your life. Lord, arm us with strength, not our own strength. We're not asking you to strengthen our arm. We're asking you to let us rely upon, take refuge in, and truly entrust ourselves to the power of your arm. That's how we become armed with strength. And Father, I thank you for it tonight. Whoever is going through whatever they're facing, help them to quickly agree with you. I can't do this in my own strength, but praise God, by my God, by my God, I can run through a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. Blessings to you all tonight. I pray that this word sinks down in your spirit. Spend time with it. Go back and look at some of these scriptures. I know we cover a lot of material. Trust God. He's got the ability to do things you've never imagined through you. Stop trying to be bigger than you are and let him be as big as he can be through you. I pray in Jesus' name. God bless you all tonight. Good night.